All right, we'll let some folks come out of the waiting room here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. While I'm doing that, I wanted to make sure and give a quick thank you to our panelists here. So we have George from the Board Retailers Association. Thank you, George. And Dan, one of our veteran M1 retail experts and the owner of Retail Smart Guys. Thanks for coming in here, Dan. To be and our here. own Dane Cohen, Sales Director at Management One. So let's go ahead and share the screen. I see some folks are still coming in. Let's go right there. Okay. You guys seeing that clearly? Perfect. Fantastic. All right. So every quarter, we like to partner with our friends, the Board Retailers Association, and speak about something that is top of mind. And one of the things that Doug, uh, the president of the board, was speaking to us is really about this idea of staying ahead of the retail curve and how folks can plan for growth in their digital future. And before I get into the actual meat of this subject, I wanna make sure and let folks know that we are gonna be doing some Q&A at the end of this. So all of the folks here that are live, if you just look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen there, if you have a question at any point in time, go ahead and hit that Q&A button and we will address those towards the end of the session. So who is Management One? For those folks that are brand new to us, thank you for joining. Our main purpose here is to provide financial security for our people, our clients, and our affiliates. And we do that through a focus on merchandise intelligence and education for independent retailers, like all of you folks here. We operate under a set of core values, that being a generous heart, courage, curiosity, adaptability, definitely top of mind in this discussion, commitment, and collaboration. In the spirit of collaboration, we like to always build partnerships that educate and empower the independent retail communities. So we like to partner with our friends at board retailers, for example, definitely our friends at the Retail Smart Guys, because Management One really focuses on one main thing, that's merchandise intelligence, but there's such a wide universe of avenues and channels available to independent retailers that we want to hear from anyone that can contribute to you guys. So we're going to keep running educational sessions like these. And if you know of a partner out there that should work with Management One, or if you have a topic, always feel free and reach out to us. And we would love to put together a session just like this that is top of mind for you. So that being said, the title that we have here, Staying Ahead of the Curve, it's no surprise during the shutdown, obviously brick and mortar stores were closed. So there was a massive shift onto the digital space. Some retailers were ready, some were not, but we have seen in our own client database and others across the country that those businesses that were able to adapt to this digital shift during COVID, not only were they able to save their business, but they were able to bounce back quicker in 2021. Now, the issue with that is it raised the bar for consumer expectations. There's almost now this baseline set of digital requirements that you have. And if you don't have them, consumers tend to look negatively on the brand and it could affect the perception of your brand. So the question that we wanna ask throughout this whole session here is, are you ahead of the curve or are you constantly catching up to the next latest and greatest trend that's going on in digital? I'm gonna throw a few facts out here. So when we're looking at investing in digital, Forbes actually ran an article just at the end of the last year there. And I believe it was just over a thousand, maybe 1500 small businesses. And 45% of them said that they're ready to start planning for a digital future. And we'll get into what that means. 28% said they're already starting to work on it. Now B of A, actually put out what they call their small business owners report just this year, I believe it was in March. And again, about a thousand retailers were surveyed here. 70% of business owners adopted new digital tools and strategies for business over the last 12 months. And of those 34% of them were on social media and bolstering up their presence. 28% of them were setting up an online sales presence. 
Now, when you look at priorities, 17% of their business owners currently prioritize digital sales now, but 44% of them say they plan to prioritize digital sales in the decade ahead. So what are we really saying here? Are we telling people that their brick and mortar is obsolete and they should just move right into digital? Absolutely not. What we're saying here, brick and mortar stores have such a massive impact on their local communities. It has a massive impact on management one here. I think 99% of our businesses are brick and mortar at least in one capacity. Maybe 1% is online only, but brick and mortar is not going anywhere this retail apocalypse that was swirling around before COVID, we've busted that myth I don't know how many times. So what we're saying here is, go ahead, Dane. Yeah, Nico, I was just gonna say, obviously, you know, I, I, you know I'm the biggest advocate of a digital future for retail, but 2021 was the first year on record since they started re uh, reporting e-commerce sales versus brick and mortar sales that physical retail sales exceeded the growth of e-commerce. So, you know, that just puts a little more muscle behind, you know, the future of, of brick and mortar and physical um, just to give a little little shout out for our, our brick and mortar locations. Absolutely. I mean, you saw it in 2021, the pent up demand that people had for an in-store experience flooded stores as soon as the doors opened again. So what we're saying here is what do you need to adopt to augment your brick and mortar location? How do you stay top of mind in front of your consumers? And there has to be at least a baseline digital presence. And it doesn't have to happen overnight. We're not saying you need to become an e-commerce juggernaut by July 1st, but you have to at least start laying the groundwork. You have to get the strategy in place. What resources do I have available? How can I incorporate this into my overall business strategy? So let's talk about some barriers because there's so many different channels here you can't adopt all of them. And some may work for you, some may work for others. The one thing that we're seeing with a lot of our retail clients is there's a pretty massive learning curve. There's so many new channels. There's so many things that they feel like they should adopt tomorrow that it can be daunting. You have to train your staff on how to operate all of these. There could be a lack of resources to not only purchase, maintain, but update these digital channels, especially e -com. make no mistake, if you're going to go 100% into e-com, it's like opening a brand new location for your store. And a lot of business owners aren't quite ready for that yet. This guy looks like he's praying that his Instagram account isn't hacked. <laughs> I think that's what he's doing. I was going to say he's trying to contact Facebook support. Anybody who has, who's ever gone that route, that's, that's the position you're going to be in right there. Um, the other problem that people see is just the uncertainty of the return on investment to their business. A lot of things in the digital world do not have a tangible dollar return amount that you can see right in that specific instance. When you're looking at top of funnel market share or increasing your visibility to your properties, that doesn't have an immediate return, but it is a gradual consistent return. It's almost like working out. You go to the gym once, are you gonna walk out of there with six pack abs on day one? No, but staying consistent and having a plan six months, 12 months later, you will start to see the return on that investment. But it's very uncertain because the dollars that you have to put up, you do see those go out immediately on day one. So let's talk about a couple of the trends that we're seeing here. The number one, obviously, online ordering. Just basic e -com. It's been around well over a decade, if not longer since the start of the internet, but a lot of brick and mortar retailers just weren't ready to dive in until 2020 hit and you absolutely had to. Now, 2021 and 2022, even though folks are coming back in store, in 2020, a lot of folks were ordering online on their desktop computers, their laptop computers. The one thing you have to keep in mind now that stores are back open, people are shifting back to their mobile devices. They're not stuck at home all day long. So when you're looking at your own website, you don't have to necessarily pay for an app, although it does help. It's certainly engaging for the consumer and it's great to have the information. We're not saying you have to go all the way to that step, but look at how your website acts on a mobile device. How is the customer experience? 
where are the calls to action on your mobile device? Is it easy to order or do you even have online ordering capabilities that are found easily on a mobile device? That's one thing to look at. If you're not quite ready to jump into the e-com pool, you don't wanna deal with credit card acquisition and dealing with merchant banks and merchant fees, at the very baseline least, have product visibility, have landing pages for the products that you have in your store with imagery, with video, with descriptive text. If you don't wanna deal with capturing the sale online, at least have a call to action that brings them into the store. Something along the lines of, I'm thinking super baseline, like a form that they fill out on a product page. That goes to an email, a sales staff in your store knows, oh, this person wants this product. Fine, we'll hold on to it for 24 hours for you. Come into the store and pick it up. At least there's a dialogue. It's not the most seamless thing, but at the very least, it's a dialogue. Because one thing we've seen is even though shoppers love to go in store, I can't remember what the exact stat is, it's in the low 80%. Shoppers begin their product discovery online. And if your brand is not online, at least in a minimal capacity, they're not even gonna know you're there. So Nico, just to throw out an, an interesting new term, you know, term, uh, you know, a lot of us are familiar with BOPIS, buy online, pick up in store. But now a new term that's being thrown out there a lot is ROPO, research online, purchase offline. And the interest in consumer engagement with researching the products that they want to purchase online and then actually physically going into the store and purchasing it offline. I mean, we've seen a huge increase and you're right, it's hovering just below 80% of consumers have engaged in this behavior. So it is now well over the majority of how uh, the American consumer is shopping. You know, I, I did a, a couple of years ago, I was actually asked to speak at, at Magic and they asked me to do a whole um, presentation about millennials. That was the topic of my thing, millennials. <laughs> and um, I was like, really, is there nothing else? But they let me do it. So uh, I had to do a whole bunch of research into that group, which is, by the way, an enormous piece of uh, the consumer market now. Mm -hmm. And they basically... Uh, through a survey, through the NRF, a couple of thousand millennials were, were surveyed and they said exactly what Dane just said, which is that they want to research online. They want to sort of check it out, make sure that it's, it makes sense to go. Uh, and then they want to go and have the in-store experience. And frankly, with gas prices where they are right now, they're going to research before they drive to your store. That's for Absolutely. sure. But, um, um, you know, I'm sitting in my living room and I'm just thinking about how much gas it cost me to get here. But, um, uh, you know, I, I still think that, that uh, they're doing tons of that research. And so that is part of the whole establishing your digital footprint so that you can be researched so people can see you and then they'll come and visit you for sure. Yeah, and I use this analogy all the time. I mean, think about just how you dine these days, right? Would yep. you sit down in a restaurant without at least viewing the menu online first? You want to get a sense of what type of food they're serving, what the pricing is before you make that reservation and actually go. And it's the same thing for retail now as well. They want a taste of the, the menu before they come in to make that, uh, you know, make the decision to come into the store. Absolutely. And that's actually a great segue into the next trend, which was entirely that, uh, BOPIS and buy online pick up at the curb. During COVID, that started to save businesses once stores were reopened. You couldn't really set foot in the store, but you can get 99% of the way there. And the good thing is for retailers, it reduces the shipping cost as well. One of the major expenses for e is getting that product directly to the door. Uh, it also encourages in-store traffic. If you're going to come all the way up into the store for that one product, it's a great opportunity for sales staff to upsell or cross-sell to new products. Uh, the one for folks like myself who wait until the day before to buy presents, you can leverage that last minute buyer. Even Amazon Prime, you have to wait a day, maybe a day and a half. Some folks like me who like to wait till the last minute, we don't have a day and a half. We need to get that product in 45 minutes. So Again, it goes with what resources you have available. Are you gonna build this massive online juggernaut with the digital infrastructure to have real-time inventory? Or can you just let folks know, these are the products that I carry, come into the store. Again, going back to the simple form fill. Fill out a form, we'll hold the product for you, come in and get it. It doesn't have to be, or if the product's out of stock, 
at least it opens the dialogue. It's not the most seamless experience, but you're opening dialogue with your customers and you're preventing them from going somewhere else. Yeah, and, and Nico, just to, sorry, just to jump in, in yep. again. Um, you know, there is a, a really interesting, I, I hear a lot when I speak to retailers, like, you know, how, how much traction can I really get in e-commerce against, you know, the big guys out there? And one of the competitive advantages uh, that independent retailers and local stores have is, you know, this idea of as your experience becomes more seamless, the customer actually has more options. So I could buy online return in store. So yep. I'll just give you a little anecdotal evidence. Uh, yesterday, I, I returned a pair of shoes and swapped it out at a local shoe store. And when I went in there, they had my size, I swapped it out and he upsold me. He gave me you know, inserts and a few pairs of socks. So that's an easy upsell when I actually come into the store and for me, you know, it's great. I could hop in my car and go return. I don't have to worry about boxing it up and taking it to the post office. I get, you know, exactly what I need for my local store. And it also gives you the chance to get the information from the buyer as well for future outreach. We're seeing, well, you know, the other, thing, the other thing I would say about this is that, you know, um, first off, a lot of people don't realize that when you buy from Amazon, it's not always from Amazon. Sometimes True. Amazon is just brokering a relationship <clears throat> from some guy who's half awake in a, a warehouse in Mississippi. You know what I mean? So it's it's not it's not exactly the Amazon thing. But but the other thing is that, you know, years ago when I was working with a men's store in Florida, I said to him, why do people shop with you? He said, because people are going to walk out of here and know they're not going to look like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> And I remember that so well, because it has to do with like, you know, what should I wear? What, should, what do I look good in? Where are things headed? And they want to talk to people who understand the merchandise and can get them to understand it. You know, Dane was just talking about inserts in shoes. Uh, I have a ton of footwear people and the whole, con the whole science of putting an insert into a shoe is not just, well, get the one that says B over there and put it in your shoes. There's a, there's a science to that. And there's an understanding of how that can affect your posture and your back and your your comfort in terms of walking and that kind of thing. So, and certainly when we talk about, you know, George, the members that are members of the, of the Board Riders Association, man, there's a ton of stuff to know about the product that you guys and, and the members of the Board Riders um, uh, offer that that education is critical and they're not gonna get it unless they interact with the retailers that are like members of the Board Riders Association as an example. And that's true because, uh... Each of our individual members, which we have thousands of members, uh, are usually the first experience people have with a with the extreme sports or board sports business. You know, whether it be skateboard, snowboard, um, stand up paddleboard, wakeboard, those kinds of things. Um, and the excitement that you get by walking into the store and talking to somebody that actually participates in those sports is helpful and something you can't really get from looking at a picture online. Yeah. And refresh my memory, George, don't you have a skate park in one of the stores that you operate? I do. I have uh, actually the third largest indoor park in America, 60,000 square feet. So there, it's an actual location that you can do all the sports that I sell because uh, I sell roller blades and roller skates, uh, skateboards, of course, uh, scooters is a big thing nowadays. Um, I don't sell BMX bikes, but I allow BMX on certain days. Uh, because people need a place to go and, and utilize these things in a safe environment. That's incredible. Awesome. So the next one that we have here is live stream sales. This is something that exploded during the pandemic, but it's continuing as a trend for several of our clients. We actually have a handful of clients. This is their only business model. But again, it goes to what resources you have available to you. Are we saying that you need to transition 100% to live stream? Absolutely not. But it is a great way of getting that captive audience for a set time in the week that you can determine. And it's something that people actually look forward to. And they know that at this specific time for this 30 minutes or this 60 minutes, there's going to be a brand new set of products that might be dropping. And this is something that you build up in your marketing leading up to it, but you get real-time engagement from your customers. It's a super cost-effective platform. Facebook Live is free. Comment sold is extremely affordable. And you have the ability to sell large amounts of product in a small amount of time. We have some clients that drop 
hundreds of products. They'll sell through an entire line just in one half hour session. And the customer retention that you get from that and just the brand recognition that you can get from something like that is pretty massive. So it's a great you know, way of- I, I have a cooking store that did, did an amazing oh, job with perfect this. Perfect example, and sold yeah. a, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of product over three days. Literally like, you know, more, I, I, uh, like $140,000 of product in three days. I mean, you know, talk about the most amazing event ever. <laughs> it was incredible. I mean, they did a lot to merchandise it and I can talk forever about what they did because uh, they did a lot to sort of enhance the event and make it work. But $140,000 of business in three days. Yeah, there are some clients that we have that will save product only for their live streams. So yeah. the customer knows that you can't even get this in store. You can't even buy it online. It's only going to be in this one half hour window. And just the scarcity that they create from that one event, they'll go through an entire line. It's it's an interesting model that you should at least explore to a small scale. And, and why this is so relevant to board retailers is because, and, and anyone who's joining us, you know, we're seeing this now expand across multiple retail verticals. Mm -hmm. But there is a, a real argument to be made that um, product that needs heavy education. Uh, especially does really well on these platforms because you're able to have that connection with the customer. You're speaking directly to them. And again, this is the competitive advantage that a local retailer, an independent retailer has over, let's say, a big corporation or, or a big box retailer out there, that you have a community, you have an expert in store that can speak to this product and speak to the actual applications of, of how it's being used in people's lives and connect directly with the customer on these new, you know, live streaming video uh, platforms. And, you know, anyone who says, you know, I can't get into that, there are some really easy solutions. If you have, you know, an iPhone, you got everything you need to go live. And that's a great segue into our next digital trend. And that's short form video. It's exactly what Dane is talking about, only it doesn't have to even be live. It can be something that you record in your store and put out snippets across all of the social platforms, whether it's, you've seen a massive rise in TikTok, it could be Facebook or Instagram Reels. This is the, the short content that is resonating, especially with the younger demographic. So I think for, for board retailers, when they're looking to target not only the younger millennials, but Gen Z, that is something that they are consuming on a massive scale. And social media platforms are taking notice. TikTok with their integration with Shopify, they're making a lot of these videos directly shoppable now. Instagram and Facebook were already doing it, but they're closing the loop on watching this video and going straight to the digital property to purchase. And that goes back to the very first trend that we were talking about, online ordering. If you're not going to at least take a dip into that pool to offer your products online, you're going to miss out on some of the newer trends like this that make things shoppable for the consumer. The fewer steps that you can remove in the process, the better it is for your overall revenue. For hey, Craig, say I, that? I, I want to jump in here for one second because video is one of those things that we've been talking about for a long time and mm -hmm. people seem to have some reticence about it. I just want to simplify this. There isn't, there, you know, unless you're a blacksmith, you have a phone now that's got video capability on it, yeah. right? And um, uh, on top of that, we're all taking videos all the time, right? That, but somehow when it turns into taking a video for the store, it's like, oh, uh, uh, there's some thought like it has to be some Steven Spielberg fade in music up kind of video to make it viable, right? I'm telling my clients these days, the best thing you can do is when you come back from lunch, the first thing you do when you come back from lunch is bust out your phone, take a video of some product in your store that you like and tell, tell us why you like it. Doesn't have to be complicated, doesn't have to be crazy, doesn't have to be this you know elaborate special effects thing. It just has to be, hey, I just came back from lunch and I really love this mug and let me tell you why, okay? And that's about it. So I, I got one of my clients to do that. I just said to them, look, every day you and every member of your staff, when you come back from lunch, shoot that short video and suddenly after about two weeks of doing that okay we have 45 videos to choose from we have content for yep. a couple you know for the next few months of video just because we did that right so it doesn't have to be complicated and frankly the more raw and the more unpolished the video is the better authentic. the more that it's just you authentic and relatable showing, 
Yeah, as long as it's authentic, as long as it's you talking about what you like and why you like it. You know, if you're if you're the buyer for the store, why you bought it. If you're on the floor, why do you like this thing? Why do you recommend to people to come in? Why do you, you know, if you're a, um, you know, one of the things that that I think is underplayed a little bit for in, in some of the surf and skate shops that I've worked with is that they forget that some of the, the people that are buying stuff are the moms and dads who don't know what the product is or why it's there or what it does or why their kid might like it. And the explanation to them will get them to buy the right gift for their kids. You know, no one's going to, when I walk into a surf or skate shop, no one's going to look at me and go, wow, that dude's out there shredding it every day. Right. I mean, uh, it's just not, you're just not going to think that when you look at me, but um, for all, you know, I got three kids that are, that are, that are doing it every day. Right. And I could be a great customer for that. These videos are a great way to educate people like me on on what the product is so that you can get those dollars and that as a as a, a parent the, that parent feels comfortable coming into your store and buying knowing that they're going to get what they want for their kid and they actually understand what they're buying and they're not lost in the fog here's the thing you know a lot of the kids that come into our store they look up to my employees and my team riders yep. and they are influencers you know in their own small way locally they're influencers so I have a requirement that we have to post at least three times a day on Facebook and Instagram um, from my employees. And, it, and I said, it doesn't have to be even content that's necessarily saleable product. It has to be, you know, in our sport with all our board sport retailers, there's a lot of action going on, a lot of skating, a lot of snowboarding, uh, you know, the scooter kids doing crazier tricks nowadays. And what I find from my research on uh, Instagram is if you just do a still shot of a product, it gets X amount of views. But if you do a video of somebody using that product, it's exponentially more interest in that product. So, and, th and then a lot of our manufacturers uh, supply us with videos, a, a new shoes coming out from Soltech, let's say, and they supply us a video of that skater I'll post the video of the skater and then I'll, then I'll, you can swipe over to see the picture of the shoe. And if I put the shoe first, there's a lot less views than if I put the action first and then you swipe to see the shoe. So, so the video is very effective. Yeah, and George, you just hit on something that is so important. I try to remind retailers of this all the time. You as a buyer are the original influencer. You as a sales associate, are an influencer. You know, we hear that term thrown around a lot and we think it only applies to people with millions of followers, but you are influencing as a buyer, as a sales associate, as a independent retailer, you are influencing, you know, the decisions that your customers are making, the trends that they're picking up on, the um, products that they are going to purchase. So, you know, don't sell yourself short and realize that you have that influencer potential at all levels of the independent retail cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And to Dan's point, I'll, I'll go to our next trend. Once you take that video, you own it and you can repurpose it in a bunch of different ways. One of the pet peeves that I have when I go on a website is you go to a product and they literally have one picture of it. If it's a shirt, it's folded neatly and it's sitting on a table and that's it. If you actually see somebody wearing the shirt, doing a 360 spin or somebody holding a skateboard, somebody riding it down the street, you can actually see how it turns and moves. So once you have that video, how are you repurposing it? And that brings us to omni-channel experience. So we're not advocating spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on getting some augmented reality system in your store or buying a smart mirror for your fitting room or an expensive kiosk when people walk in. You don't need those things. It could be as simple as just having an iPad on your front table that shows some of the products in action or having a QR code on the label on a pair of pants or on a skateboard. They scan that QR code and it goes to whatever video you shot on that product. Very simple things that you can do to add to the experience in store or online will help engage that customer with your brand. Uh, the Business of Fashion just last week put out an article and customers who engage with in-store technology spend up to four times longer shopping than those who do not. And that's a pretty massive amount of time for people. I didn't see that article, but did they talk about Crate and Barrel at all during that article? 
don't believe so. It might have been a different. So a few months ago, I saw an article about Crate and Barrel. And what they did was they put little iPads at the at like sort of at the cap stand at the end of each aisle yep. where people in that aisle could then do some online research about the products that were in that aisle. And they saw something like a 45 percent increase in sales as a result of that. Yeah. Just because people do, you know, people, there's this whole thing about like, oh, if I talk to a salesperson, they're going to, you know, they're going to sell me yep. <laughs> the terror of being sold. You know, nobody wants to be sold, but everybody wants to buy. Right. But having that, those, those little iPads that are there that have maybe a loop playing of just some interesting stuff about the, the, the merchandise that you're selling there gives the, gives the customer a chance to get a little research without having to talk to a salesperson. And that, sometimes also gets them to be willing to talk to a salesperson or be willing to interact with the product a little bit more. So I've seen a bunch of people do some pretty, pretty interesting stuff with that too. I think with all of this stuff, you just have to get the, you know, talk to someone who has sort of a good understanding of the so sort of what's out there in terms of the, the array of all this stuff and then pick your spots to get started. You can't do every bit of this. You exactly. have to decide which ones are going to have the most impact in your store. Um, and, and I agree. I don't think you need to worry as much about the e-commerce stuff. You know, I've been hearing about the death of brick and mortar since no. JC Penney shipped <laughs> the first catalog in 1969. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, uh, there is no killing brick and mortar retail ever. Don't let anybody ever convince you of that. All the articles that say that are just completely not true. And our stores are doing amazing business now in brick and mortar. And the reason is, is that people love it and they're always going to love it. And the foothold that they have in their local communities is not going to go For away sure. either. For sure. Uh, the last one that I wanted to talk about, not all digital technology is for the consumer. So let's talk a little bit about back of house. So when you're talking about a digital store, what are you doing in the back of the house in terms of keeping a database for your clients? Is this something that's in a Rolodex? I'm dating myself for knowing that word, but are you writing this down in a ledger or do you actually have some sort of digital CRM system? Uh, the image that you have up on the screen here is actually one of our partners, OneShop, and they developed a whole clientele app that's available on iPhones and iPads for sales staff. So David comes into the store, every single salesperson has access to what David purchased, what brands he likes, when the last time he purchased from the store, every history about that particular client is accessible to all sales staff. So it's it's a way of staying collaborative with very minimal digital tech. Uh, how is your staff able to message each other? Do you guys, does everybody have each other's cell phone numbers? Do you have a group chat? Do you have something like Slack where everybody can get on the same page, whether you're in store or not? How are you training staff? Do you have digital properties where a new sales associate can come in and actually view some of the content that you have. They can view processes that you've set up in your store. Scheduling. Do you still have a whiteboard in the back where you're erasing names and putting up new ones? Or is there an actual scheduling app that every single employee has access to, even if they're at home on their phone? Marketing is another one. Is there just one person that's able to respond to somebody on social media? Or do all sales staff have access to messaging on social media? Those are the kinds of things that you need to think about back of house in terms of digital trends. I just will say I have several clients that are using the uh, the one shop app for clienteling yeah. and the return on investment has been off the charts. You know, uh, as we get into this weird moment of um, uh, of the economy where, you know, there's talk of inflation, there's talk of recession, there's talk of the earth leaving its orbit and going crashing into the sun. Right. I mean, you know, we're, there's all kinds of craziness that people talk about in terms of the uh, economy right now. Clienteling is key in, in at this moment in history, because if people are nervous or they're, they're worried about buying stuff, the individual outreaches to customers to get them to come and buy and entice them with product is everything. And the one shop platform does a better job of that than anything I've ever seen. In, in fact, at one point we were thinking about creating an app that does that. And once I saw one shop, I'm like, why he did it. He did everything you could possibly want to do. Um, uh, and I can't emphasize this enough nowadays, more than ever, especially when people are bombarded with group messaging and, and uh, stuff that's sent out to the broad general public, the more that you can individually reach out to individual people and entice them with products that you know are good for them, 
is uh, is what's going to drive sales. And one shop does a better job of that than anybody. The other thing to think about on that respect too is that first party data is so much more valuable now than third party data. We have folks like uh, Google and Facebook, their tracking pixels are going to become less and less useful in 2023 as they start moving away from that third party data. Yeah. Apple blocking uh, app tracking across apps. You can't just acquire that data through third party programs anymore. You actually have to go out do the work and keep that customer relationship going. And a clienteling app or even a CRM, or even if it's just a, a Google spreadsheet that everybody has access to, I'm talking minimal, minimal baseline, you have to make sure that your sales staff, all of them collaboratively have access yeah. to your client database. We talk about this all the time. Uh, you know, Email marketing, by the way, is still the number one driver of sales at retail. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I like to do this game, so I'll do this with you, George, because you're another panelist here. George, how many emails do you think you get a day? Probably 100. Okay, George gets 100 emails a day. He gets 700 a week. He gets 3,000 emails a month. Mm -hmm. If I email him once a month, I have a one divided by 3,000 chance of getting his attention. In the time that we've done this webinar, Nordstrom's has probably emailed me three times. I still haven't unsubscribed. It's about mind share. It's about reminding them that you're there and it's about hitting them at the right time when something might trigger for them. But some people, a lot of people are very afraid about annoying people with too many emails. You know, there's nobody that says, gee, I wish I got more email ever, right? No one's ever said. No. Nope, I think we might've lost him. Right at the, right in the middle of a point. I do, I do get a hundred emails a day and I don't necessarily uh, junk mail oh, all of them. Oh, Some of them may be interesting to me. I, if you're back, Dan, we, we lost you for a I'm second. back. Uh, yeah, I, okay. I, I have a, a squirrel that runs on my router that turns it to get me <laughs> online. So it takes it. Sometimes he runs a little slow. Right. He, maybe he's not the most tech savvy. You need to hire. No, no, no. I need it. Exactly right. He gets distracted easily. So. I, w I was following up by mentioning that, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, with, with technology and, and the rest of that, um, you know, you can you, you go ahead and finish your point first. I'm not sure where I got cut off. What was the last thing I said? Really? But, uh... No one wants more emails. Oh, so nobody wants more emails, that's for sure. But the truth of the matter is, is that um, the as long as your unsubscribe rate is below 2%, you're not annoying people. Right. And you have to sort of do the math on some of this, right? I've got a client has got an 8,000 name mailing list, right? He's got a 20% open rate. That means that 1,600 people at least saw the message, at least got the word out that whatever about what he's doing, okay? 3% you know, uh, engaged with him on that level. Not a great percentage, but still 3% of 2,400 people, of 8,000 people, right? It's 240 people. So when you're wondering like, where am I, where's my revenue gonna come from? You know, do the math, that's the answer right there. Is what, and then what I was mentioning was, you know, I get those hundred emails a day and I, I don't necessarily junk mail them all because there's somebody that may be relevant to me somewhere down the road. Mm -hmm. The beauty of email of and getting so many of them is you can, choose who you want to keep and who do you, who you don't want to. So there's several people that I'll see their emails over and over again. I may not even open them, but one day I might say, Hey, that interests me. So I leave it on the, I leave it on the list and I don't necessarily put, put them all to spam. Hey, George, mm -hmm. I'm begging you to open my email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just open mine. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I'll take you off the junk mail. Thing. Thanks man. Appreciate that. Uh, no, cool. problem. no problem. No, but, uh, um, you know, we were talking earlier about how, how um, you know, you know, the whole technology thing has come along. And, and I'll I tell you what, we do use the group chat. Uh, that's how I can stay in touch with all my employees, even when they're not working. And they don't have a problem engaging, even if they're not at work, uh, if, it's, if it's important to them or necessary for them to answer a question. And it keeps us all in touch with things. Um, and other technologies that we use that are beyond just making sales is, I, I control all my uh, HVAC units on my phone now. You know, I can, no. I can, I've saved a lot of money by just using my, my phone to dial up or down or reprogram depending on the weather. Um, uh, wow. You know, when, with our skate park, you know, we do a lot of lessons and clinics and people can go and sign up online uh, without ever having to come into the store. They can read all about what it's about. They can call if they want. They can, they can look up more information. 
Uh, you can now sign a waiver online, which we never had before. It used to be parents would drive two hours. They'd have a kid that wasn't their child, so they couldn't sign a waiver for them. So we'd have to fax a waiver to somebody. They'd have to fill it out and fax it back or e you know, eventually email it back. And now they can fill it out online. Boom, it's in my computer in seconds, and it's legal, and they can, they can come in. So there's a lot of other technologies that can be done to make your business more efficient and save a lot of time, which is money. Yeah, and, and George, I think that is, that is so important because I think a lot of times we get caught up on the word e-commerce, right? And uh, dollar for dollar, you know, e-commerce may or may not be a profitable business model for your retail store, right? We know it's important to have it. We know we have to invest in it. We know we have to look forward to it. But I think it's more about what is your digital strategy, right? So something as simple as being able to sign up for an in-store event online, yeah. you know, that is part of your digital strategy. You know, it's simple, but it, it can make all the difference. And so, you know, I really encourage, you know, retailers out there and the retailers on this call to think about your digital strategy more holistically than just shooting product and getting it up on, on e-commerce, because I think that's where we get tripped up a little bit. And it's, listen, the reality is it's, it's tough to compete um, in this in this e-commerce marketplace, but where you really can compete and even um, win uh, is really on these digital strategies that kind of combine the in-store experience with the your digital presence. Yep. And, and for those that are, you know, taking a look at the cost of it, um, I know that a lot of our members, uh, part of their issue is pulling the trigger on an online platform pricing. As uh, Nico talked about earlier, there's a lot of upfront costs recurring monthly costs, uh, cost of sales, you know, you got Switching your costs, yep. you got your, your, your uh, 2% for the platform. Um, and so it's a big upfront cost. I, I, a quick example, I started, I searched around, you know, looked at a lot of different ones, big commerce. I, I chose Shopify about five, six years ago. Uh, and I was three or four years into it when uh, we had to close our retail store. And everybody ran out of inline skates online and somebody called up and they're like, you know, Amazon's out of rollerblades. I'm like, Amazon's out of rollerblades. <laughs> and for some reason, I don't have all the money to be on the front page every day. But once everybody in the world ran out, I was the one that the entire world came to. And my online sales jumped uh, 10 times I, in, 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 for a series of several months. And, and then, um, uh, I know one of our topics was, was, you know, how do you, how do you mix your online mix? Well, I ended up buying skates that were less expensive than what I would normally carry in the store because generally people online are wanting an economical product. Um, my selection is gems tends to be medium to high end. Uh, but I was buying the, the lowest price skates. Number one, I could get them at the time. And, and the internet said, this is what I'm looking for. So I sold literally hundreds and hundreds of those when, when inline skates were dead for a minute and then it became very popular because people got bored with walking around the block. So the fact that I had made the move and got online put me ahead of the curve. And now I'm making some other moves. I'm using one of our associate partners, Ricks, to uh, update my point of sale uh, software so that it interacts with uh, Shopify much better. And, and it, it's gonna save a ton of paperwork because they were two separate platforms. Now they're going to be integrated into one platform. And again, money up front, money by the month. But I, I look at it as marketing dollars. You know, I used to spend a ton of money on the yellow pages back in the 80s, being in all these different towns and bigger ads and the whole nine yards. And, uh, and, and now I look at, you know, your website as the new yellow pages. Uh, um, to Dane's point, we were, people go online and they look at your store and say, oh, he doesn't have that. I'm going to go somewhere else when you may have it. But if it doesn't, if you don't show it online or at least give an indication that you may have it, um, people are going to bypass your store because that's the new yellow pages to me. So the things I'm glad you brought it up too. We didn't put it in, in our trends, but online advertising, there's a misconception that you have to spend tens of thousands of dollars a month just to get your brand out there. Um, I believe it was crystal media. Uh, they came to our event in April they have a great program and they have some great client testimonials of folks that have run very simple ads for literally dollars, single dollars per day. And they were able to effectively generate sales. So that the stigma against online advertising, it's, it's very similar to e-com. 
you don't have to invest thousands and thousands of dollars to get something impactful. Nico, let me just throw out one other thing because I know we're getting short on time and I, I think this is an important thing. I find that a lot of times that people walk away from, from seminars like this and they just go like, well, I don't even know where to start. Here, this is what I would suggest. I always tell uh, all of our clients that the, 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 it's hard to do marketing inside your store and it's hard to do it inside your house, right? It's, those are two very hard, two different places to do it. We tell people, take the last whatever, the last Tuesday, the last Wednesday, the last Thursday of the month, whatever it is, and go someplace else that's not your store and not your house. Um, I have someone that goes to like a, they go to a coffee bean that overlooks a, a, a cliff and a waterfall because it gets them thinking out there, which is what should happen with marketing, right? And map out what you're going to do the next month, right? So you can sit there and go, okay, so what emails am I going to send next month? What video? do I want to shoot next month? What live events do I want to do next month? And just sort of map out a little bit of a calendar there. But if you take the, if you always put on your schedule the last Tuesday or the last Wednesday or Thursday of the month and just, you know, even build a grid for yourselves. We, ha we have a grid and I'm happy to share it with people, but it's like, okay, well, what am I going to do? Uh, and some of that might be like things like you look at, well, what shipments do I expect next month? So I can figure out, so I can align my marketing with, okay, well, these goods are going to land. I want to make sure I've got uh, some, some stuff uh, lined up to, to market that so when it hits the floor it starts selling right away but you got to take that last day of the month and lay out what you're going to do for the next month so that it's on a calendar and you're not coming in on one day and going i wonder what i'm going to post today you know that's where it all falls off the rails and that's when people don't do it because they feel like oh that idea is never good enough i'm not doing that that kind of thing marketing requires a good amount of planning it requires foresight, forethought and foresight you've got to Take that last week of the month and take a day and just go someplace and lay out what the strategy is. And then you can give it to the rest of your team. These are the emails I want you to write. These are the videos I want you to shoot. This is the content I want you to create, that kind of thing, so that you're not always chasing it. You're always behind the wheel. Most independent retailers find themselves doing the marketing absolutely last. There's always a customer to deal with, a vendor to deal with, an employee to deal with, something happening at the store. George has to turn down the thermostats on his air conditioning units. You know what I mean? There's always something going on there that keeps you from doing the marketing. And the only way it works out uh, effectively is to actually take a day, the last Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of the month, go to someplace that makes you happy and lay out your strategy for it. And don't do it at the store because too many people are going to ask you questions and don't do it at home because, you know, the dog needs to be pet. The mail has to be open. There's a million reasons why it's hard to do at home. So I'm a big fan of going someplace else. Yep. And there's actually an article that I read that said you should have the next 60 days at least 80% of your content should be planned out 60 days in advance. There's always going to be the thing that pops up in your head that day and you, you can post it out that day totally. for sure, but at least have a good 60 days of content planned out ahead of time. Even if you yeah. just get 30 to start with, you know, yeah. and then you rep start up to that, 80. I mean, you got to start with something. If you've just got, I'm going to do these next three posts, at least go there and get that going. Yep. And then for those that don't have a budget for, uh, let's say, an online uh, category, because there's a lot of back end of, of entering all that product, taking pictures, descriptions, and the rest, putting it up on your site. So it's 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 like you said, it's it's like opening another store. Um, yeah. When I first got online, it was 1999. And my brother-in-law was doing Ford Motor Company's website, and he gave me the good guy discount of $18,000 to set up a website for myself. Whew. And uh, I ended up going with eBay at $19.95 a month and quickly jumped to $49.99 a month. Um, so eBay is a good alternative to get started inexpensively, to have a presence online with, with a built-in customer base. Beware, there's certain products that are not allowed to be sold on eBay platforms or Amazon. Uh, but I would say uh, more than anything, if you don't have any online sales platform, eBay might be a good economical way to get started and then research some of these other online platforms and find out where your budget is. And like I said, consider it marketing. It's, uh, it's part of your marketing budget to have your name out there. Facebook marketplace too. I mean, that's, that's a free platform that folks can use if they're not ready to dive hundred percent into the e-com on their own website platform. Absolutely. So before I turn it over to our, our audience Q and a, I did have a couple of questions uh, for the panel. So we're as Dan said, we're running a little short on time. I'm going to curate some of these questions I had up here. So Dan, one thing I wanted to ask you, because uh, I know that you do a, some of this as part of Retail Smart Guys, what role does outsourcing play in some of these digital properties? Because again, they can't do everything in-house. 
We have a, a group that we work with that's offshore that does a tremendous amount of this work for our retailers. Um, and uh, they do things like, you know, they even do it for me. They do it for Retail Smart Guys. And so uh, well, as an example, um, I was creating posts. I was doing all that stuff all the time. But, you know, they are, first off, better artists than I am. So the graphics are a lot better. And secondly, they, in, in Facebook, as an example, they got me into about 50 different groups having to do with retailing. I didn't even know it existed out there. So suddenly my digital footprint got that much bigger as a result. So um, it's a way to use some of that labor that doesn't look. We're all we all know that right now hiring people is the hardest thing to do in the industry, right? Trying to find good employees now is really super hard. So whatever administrative tasks you can um, farm out to some of these other folks, which is super inexpensive, by the way, um, farm it out to those guys so that your staff and you are focused on your customers, your sales, and your inventory. Uh, and, and keeping up with and, and making sure you've got good employees for the employees that are there so that you're not mired in administrative nightmares, right? That's the kind of stuff that you can farm out and you can farm it out for less than minimum wage and do it. And, and they do an amazing job and they're excited to have the work. They want the work and they do an incredible job with it. So I'm a, I, uh, I hope if, if any of you are running into that, reach out to me for that because that's, that's been a game changer for so many clients I work with right now. The other thing too is in local communities, I mean, you could find a high school intern that can totally. manage social way easier than you could do it if you were going to do it on your own. Totally. And that's a way of, of keeping your local community active as well. Okay. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. George, I had a question for you. I was curious for your board retailer members, all of the trends mm -hmm. that we had up here on the screen in this session what do you think would be the most troublesome for your members? Or is there one that stands out that, that has been most slowly adopted? And why do you think that is? Well, I'd say, you know, one of the biggest problems, and I know I've experienced myself uh, having been doing this retail thing for 43 years now, um, is, is budgeting your time to address these new technologies. Uh, no one has time these days. There's, like I said, 100 emails, 100 phone calls. Everybody wants to sell you the next best thing. Um, your customers are in there. Customers come first. They all want to talk. You're like a bartender. You don't. You don't want to. You can't leave. You, you got. That's yeah. a great analogy. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, those are all the, some of the most fun things of the job is being on the floor and talking to the customers and making a sale and them walking out the door saying thank you and and, and the world goes on. Um, the 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 biggest problem I think most of us have is budgeting that time. To Dan's point, is that you need to. You need to make that time. You need to you need to set that time aside uh, on a regular basis so that you can plan out that week. And you'd be surprised in one hour sitting alone how much you can plan out for the week instead of shooting from the hip all day long and finding out, oh, geez, it's six o'clock and I forgot to call this person. It's closed at five, you know, and 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 uh, and I hadn't gotten to that yet today. And I'll put it on tomorrow's list. Um, so so I'd say budgeting time is probably the, one of the more important things that we need to do better. And have you seen a shift in hiring trends lately with your members or even Dan as well? Are your customers looking, is this something that they're looking at when they're hiring new employees on their sales board? Do you need to have a baseline set of digital acumen? Well, I, t I tell you what I, I, what I look at, I always said I would, I would rather hire a good salesperson and teach them how to skateboard than hire a good skateboarder and teach them how to sell. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, from that perspective of on-floor presence, or even you know, if you're communicating with people online and you you're our social media person, um, you you need to be knowledgeable about the product, and you need to understand where the customer is coming from and think on your feet. Um, so, do they have to be certainly tech savvy? Not necessarily. Obviously, it seems like to me everybody I interview for an internet job seems to think they can create the next internet. Uh, site that's going to make them millions of dollars so that they, they they it's hard to pay a fair amount in my mind to somebody to develop our own website because they think they can do better elsewhere it, it's a fine line finding the person that's willing to do that and then do some projects on their own i think you want to see that if you're hiring people specifically for the digital stuff you want to you know they should come to you with a portfolio of work typically this is what i've done this is uh uh, posts yeah. I've done that, that kind of thing that you, normally you want to see that you know um, uh, 
I, I wouldn't expect them to, you know, but, but to George's point, they've got to be able to sell. They've got to be outgoing and willing. That was what Harry Friedman said years ago, and it's still true today. The rest is all trainable, you know. So most of my retailers tell me what they're really looking for in employees, that someone's going to show up, frankly. I mean, it's been a really rough hiring uh, um, uh run here and i'm hoping that gets a little bit better shortly but it and, and some of my clients are telling me now they're starting to see people show up again and wanting to work and stuff like that so i'm encouraged that it's getting a little bit better but um uh outgoing and willing is everything so we have a shy audience right now i don't see any questions so i'm going to pose one to dan here because i know dan is well, a repository go ahead dan Sorry, I, I just wanted to mention one thing because I, I, I uh, hate to leave this without talking about inventory planning for just one second. Um, you know, I, all the things that we are talking about, I think one of the most important things to, to hear here is that we are talking about omni-channel in its truest sense now, right? You, are no, you can no longer look at yourself as a four-wall retail institution. You know, you have people coming in through your social, through e-commerce, through live selling, through your physical door, you are now a multi-location retailer, even if you just have one location. And so if, if we're selling in a new era, we need to be buying for a new era as well. And you need to be planning your buys for this new uh, reality of how retail and digital is coming together. And that means that, you know, a wide and thin assortment strategy in this type of market is just not going to work. You have to have some, you know, meaning and some, and some real kind of conviction behind your buys and being able to plan that out, you know, that is going to seep through your messaging and your, um, you know, ability to really reach the customer. I mean, if you go in soft on something now and you're selling it across, you know, your store, your social, live selling and e-commerce, I, I mean, right there, that's one, two, three, four. If you're buying six of a style or a size run, I mean, it, it's just a new age. So, you know, the products that matter, the categories that matter to you, you know, taking a narrow and deep approach it is more important now than ever. Well, and I got to tell this story really fast. Okay. So, so years ago, retail smart guys got hired by a shopping mall and here's why, here's what happened. Um, the, all the tenants at the mall said, went to the landlord and said, you know what, we don't, we're not getting enough foot traffic and you got to do something to make this happen. You got to get us foot traffic, foot traffic, foot traffic, foot traffic. Right. So he goes and somehow through a friend of a friend, he reaches out to Yoko Ono. Okay. <laughs> Gets to Yoko. Okay. And Yoko agrees to do a John Lennon original artwork show at the mall, okay? So if John scribbled on a cocktail napkin, they framed it and put it up at the mall, okay? A thousand people descend on the mall, okay? And it didn't make a difference to the stores that were there. It should have been, hey, listen, I'm going to go to that store and you meet me over at that one after you're done with that. They should have done a crazy amount of business, but it didn't mean a thing to them. Why? Because those stores, to Dane's point, didn't have relevant merchandise, didn't plan their purchases, didn't plan their sales. And, 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 and as we head into this kind of uncertain economic time, turn is going to be king. And no matter what you're doing, think about if you could turn a half turn faster. If you're a million dollar store, if you're a board writer store and you're, and you're doing a million dollars and you're turning two and a half times and you could turn to three times, it puts another $40,000 in your pocket. I can do the math and show that to you. So you know, the, you spend more on inventory than anything else in your store, more than marketing, more than personnel, more than rent, anything like that. And if your inventory is wrong, then your marketing can never work. I mean, if you did the greatest marketing in the whole world, all this digital stuff to get people there and your inventory is wrong, imagine how much more marketing you're going to have to do to get them back after you failed to entice them when you first got them there. And that's the benefit of planning, which is what Management One and, and all of us on this call are all about um, uh, as the core of what we do. So don't let the marketing uh, uh, dissuade you from uh, the importance of inventory planning and forecasting and having the right goods at the right time at the right location. And I'm glad you brought that up too, because what works in store sometimes doesn't work online and vice versa. Sure. So when you look at, you have to really keep a, a close focus on how quickly your products are moving in and out. And if you see something that isn't really working in your in-store, but it is flying off the digital shelves on your website, that's something that is going, as Dane mentioned, that's gonna affect your future buys. But you're not gonna know that unless you stay laser focused on those metrics weekly or monthly. 
Well, I know we are at the hour here. I wanted to be mindful of our panelists and I wanted to thank Dan and George and Dane for showing up today. And thank you all for the audience here. If folks did have to leave, we recorded this session. We are gonna put it up on our YouTube channel and on the Board Retailers Association website. And we look forward to seeing everybody on the next session. I would say if any of you guys have any questions, please reach out to all of us that are panelists on here. We're here to help you. Uh, we want to uh, ensure that you guys are doing well. Retail is the backbone of all the, the entire small business community. And we need to make sure you guys are healthy and doing well. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that that happens. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Nico. Good to be with you, Dan and George. You too, sir. <laughs>